Colonialism did a number on the African continent, especially when we consider all the destroyed artifacts or burned cities. We also have to take into account environmental factors that led to the deterioration of historical areas. However, the legend of these sites never truly died, and that's something that we in the diaspora can be proud of. Today, I wanted to start a mini-series on classical cities in Africa. <laughs> What up African world, it's home team here and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. By supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and supporting this content. If you'd like access to full courses and sources, or you simply want to show your support, you may do so by clicking the Patreon link in the description box below. In this mini-series, there will be some African cities I will miss, so I would like for you guys in the comments section below to name some classical African cities that you feel are noteworthy. Let's begin. Arguably the most popular classical African city in all of Africa is of course Timbuktu. We may get tired of hearing it as it's the most promoted, but its popularity is merited. Timbuktu is a city located near the Niger River on the southern border of the Sahara Desert in Mali, West Africa. Local tradition dates the founding of Timbuktu to around the year 1100 AD at a seasonal nomad camp based around a well maintained by an enslaved woman according to the Tariq es Sudan, which is the primary source for the history of the region. The woman's name was reportedly Buktu, and Tin means well, hence the Well of Buktu. In the 11th century, merchants from various Mandate peoples, perhaps of Soninka or Dula origins, set up various markets and built permanent dwellings in the town, establishing the site as a meeting place for people traveling by camel. By the 12th century, Timbuktu was already an active trading post on the routes crossing the Sahara into West Africa. In the 14th century, the town was absorbed by the Mali Empire and enjoyed a period of prosperity Timbuktu had a reputation as a center for Islamic learning that began with the construction of the Great Mosque in the 14th century. Leo Africanus tells us that in the middle of the city was a temple built with mason stones and limestone mortar and a large palace. Manza Musa can be credited with the beautification of Timbuktu by hiring architects in the 14th century. Perhaps the most prominent feature of Timbuktu during its prime was Sankor University, a learning center that once accommodated as many as 25,000 students. The author of the Tariq es Sudan came out of this university. There is absolutely no doubting the vast legacy and rich history of Timbuktu. Our next classical city is Marrakesh. Marrakesh is a city in West Central Morocco. It has a long history of being one of the principal commercial centers in all of Morocco. The old section of the city, often called Medina, was surrounded by a large palm grove and consisted of fortified walls built in the 12th century. Marrakesh is sometimes called the Red City because its buildings and ramparts, built during the Almohad period, are made from beaten clay of a rusty color. The most popular building in Marrakesh is perhaps the Towering Mosque. Marrakesh was founded in the 11th century during the rise of the Almoravid Empire. One of the founders of the Amoravids was Abu Bakari Abin Umar. He became the principal ruler once his brother had been killed, and he later moved his men from Agmat to a place that later became the classical city of Marrakesh. In September of 1068, Abu Bakari married Zainab, a beautiful, educated, and wealthy widow of the former ruler of Agmat. That same year, he decided to move his garrison from Agmat further west and founded the city of Marrakesh, which offered a more defensible location. Even though Abu Abin Umar of the Amoravids founded this classical city, he later moved back into the desert to live the nomadic lifestyle he was more accustomed to. The city then was developed further and passed through the hands of various dynasties. In 1147, Marrakesh was captured by the Almohads, who between 1152 and 1160 were able to conquer all of the eastern Maghreb. Then, in 1269, Marrakesh passed into the hands of the Marinids, who moved their capital to Fez in northern Morocco. 
New caravan routes began to bypass Marrakesh and the city suffered economically. By the time the Sadian dynasty seized control of the city in 1525, it was a poor place largely in ruins. The Sadian dynasty revitalized Marrakesh, making it the new capital of southern Morocco. By the end of the 16th century, Marrakesh was once again the leading city of Morocco, culturally and economically, with about 60,000 inhabitants. And last but not least, we have the classical city of El Ubini, known to us today as Benin City. Benin City was the capital of the Benin Empire located in southern Nigeria. The city was home to the Obas or Kings of Benin since its founding around the 13th century. Benin served as a center of trade in ivory, cloth, and pepper to the Europeans in the 15th century and it was also very famous for its legendary artwork. There is no better way to describe this classical city than from the mouths of European travelers themselves. So please bear with me as I quote them directly. Our first quote comes from a 17th century Dutch scholar named Dr. Olfer Daper. The town, comprising the Queen's Court, is about 5 or 6 miles in circumference. It's protected at one side by a wall 10 feet high, made of double stockades of big trees, tied to each other by cross beams fastened crosswise and stuffed up with red clay, solidly put together. The town possesses several gates, eight or nine feet in height, and five in width, with doors made of a whole piece of wood, hanging or turning on a peg, like the peasants' fences here in this country. The king's court is square, and stands at the right-hand side when entering the town by the gate of Gaton, or Guato, and is certainly as large as the town of Harlem, and entirely surrounded by a special wall, like that which encircles the town. It is divided into many magnificent palaces, houses, and apartments of the courtiers, and comprises beautiful and long square galleries, about as large as the exchange at Amsterdam, but one larger than another, resting on wooden pillars from top to bottom, covered with cast copper on which are engraved the pictures of their war exploits and battles, and are kept very clean. Dr. Roth, writing in the 1890s, gave the following description of a Benin house. The house is about 60 by 25 feet. It is furnished with a pent roof all round. The roof is supported by heavy rafters, much resembling the oak roofings of old houses in England. The rafters are carved, but most of them are covered with the figured brass sheetings, which are so characteristic of the king's buildings and are kept polished. The soil is banked up all round the walls to the height of about 18 inches. This embankment gives the center of the house the look of a hollow after the manner of the Roman villas. Writing at the same time, another European observer had this to say. There was usually an entrance court giving onto the street by a big door. There were two recesses. In one were ranged the Lares and Penates and the father of the household celebrated yearly rites in memory of his father. Through the other recess by a door, entrance was gained to the first patio or reception room. The thatch sloped down to the center and drained into the cistern, exactly as one sees in the houses of Pompeii. The drains were made very ingeniously. While modern scholars tend to shy away from comparing Benin and Roman architectural affinities, the fact that they were compared by scholars and observers in the past just goes to show how Benin City mirrored any other classical city around the world, a perspective that is in direct opposition to how African architecture is portrayed in popular culture today. While I'm all out guys, I'm really hoping that you'll enjoy this mini-series on classical African cities. And if you like these videos and want to help in its continued production, consider supporting the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace.